Let's start. My name is Álvaro Videla, as you can see there, and the conference is about messaging patterns, and they are oriented towards RabbitMQ. So uh, an introduction about me. I'm working at Lip AG, which is a company in Switzerland, in Zurich, and Lausanne, Bern, and I mean, everywhere in, in Switzerland. That's my blog, my Twitter account. Before, three months ago, I used to live in China, actually, and we were building one of the dating sites from Germany. And there, we use a lot of RabbitMQ to scale this website. And yeah, my, I'm original from Uruguay, so I've been kind of traveling around so far. I'm writing the book RabbitMQ in Action, together with a guy from the States. Uh, yeah, we are now in the early access program, so you can get the book, you can get the PDF, you can get up to chapter six or five, I, guess, I think. And yeah, we are trying to get the book ready for, for release. So to start with the talk, the first uh, question we, we should ask ourselves is why do I need messaging? So to illustrate this, this point, I want to go with an example like a, that I like to use most of the time, which is like if we are asked to implement a photo gallery for our website, which will have two parts. One is to have a, an upload form, and then to just display the, the pictures in a, in a gallery, which is really, really simple, until we start to get new requirements. And why? Let's say we have a product owner, it's like in a Scrum kind of working environment. Oh, so he wants that every time there is a new picture upload, we notify all the friends of the user. So there, there is something new for, for this simple upload form. And he wants that implemented for tomorrow. Then our company hires the latest social media guru, guy, whatever. <laughs> And this guy wants to give badges to user for each picture of load because it's what everybody else is doing. So, <laughs> and this has to be on Twitter also. <laughs> so yeah, then the Swiss admin or Swiss admin in my case comes to us and say, "Hey, you are delivering full-size images. The bandwidth has tripled. The accountant manager is about to kill me. So we need this fix for yesterday." Great. Yeah, I, I was supposed to be uploading pictures only. But. <laughs> then the developer on the other team comes to us and say, yeah, I want to call your PHP stuff from Python, and yeah, maybe Java, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the user, which the user doesn't actually care about all our business requirements. He doesn't care that we need to, to resize the picture. He doesn't care that uh, we need to send a Twitter message to every friend that, that that to tell him that we got a new picture. All I want as a user is to click a button, get my picture uploaded in less than whatever it takes my bandwidth to get the picture from my computer to your server. After that, I really don't care. I want to see a confirmation. So that's something that we sometimes, as, as developers, we forget. We start with all these requirements in the background, and then we forget that, that a user has a terrible experience. <laughs> But then it comes us, the developer, which saw all that, and yeah, that's the answer we have for, for this kind of evolution. So let's see what happened with the code. This was our first, first implementation. Here I'm using Erlang as pseudocode, so I, I consider that is pretty readable. So we have a put request to a, a path, which is user image, with some request data. And whenever we got that, what we used to do was to just handle the upload, and on request data, we got the, the file. So very, very easy. <coughs> then we resize the image because the sysadmin asked to do that. Then we also had to notify the friends because the product owner wanted that. Then. We have to add points to the user for the social media guru guy. Also tweet that there is a new image, and so on. So can our code scale to new requirements? It can't, because 
every time there was something new, we had to go there and modify the code. So for example, what if we need to speed up the image conversion? What happens with that code that is doing the resize there when it has to, to do it, I don't know, concurrently in 100 servers, 20 machines on Amazon EC2, whatever. So <coughs> what happens if the notification, in, instead of being sent by the internal message system of the website, they, now they have to be sent by email. We have to go that there again and do some changes. What if we have to stop tweeting about new images? In this case, we'll be scaling down the code requirements. If we have to resize in different formats and so on, so will we always go to that code and modify something and so on? The question is, can we do better? Sure we can, and we can do it using messaging, which is what I want to show you. So the design here will be to use the publish subscribe design pattern. There's a whole book about design patterns for messaging, so this topic is really deep. Which, in fact, what we have here, this is from the book, the, this uh, graphic. We have a publisher that sends an event to the message system, and then the, all the subscribers, those that are interested in this event, will get a, a notification. Whatever they do, we don't care as publishers. We don't care if there are one subscriber or 20. So this is a way to decouple the design of the previous code. So the first implementation will be, OK, we do the upload. We get some image data, metadata there, whatever that is, the image path, and I don't know, something. And then from the request, we get the current user to get the user ID or some information like that. And then we just publish a message, which will be new image plus message. This code won't work. It's just pseudo code in the face of Erlang, but it's not uh, to be run. You can write something like that if you want. So then we have a friend notifier, which will be a subscriber that on new image and the message will notify the friends based on the user field of the message and the image of, of the message. Then the point manager, the, again, on new image, will add points to the user, and so on. And yeah, the image resizer will also, when it gets this event, it, it will process, process the image. If we need to, do, to have like 20 image converters, we should fire 20 processes of this one, that will work. If we need to speed up the friend notification, the same we can do there. We suddenly, this guy doesn't have any more friends. We can remove the notifiers. Nothing will broke in the code on the controller side, the one that is handling the image upload. So what is the second implementation? There is none. We just need to have that part on the controller. That's all we need to do and what messaging allows us to decouple. If we think or architectures with this kind of patterns, then what happens on, happens on the other end of the network, we actually don't care. Of course, it may be us implementing all this other logic here, but it can be a team somewhere else. I don't know. So to continue, what is messaging? We use messaging to share data across processes. Processes can be part of different applications. So we don't have only communication inside our application. We can make applications talk together. Then the application can live in different machines. The communication is asynchronous. This is something really important about messaging. There is not, not such thing like as a synchronous method call. We can fake one, but there is no such thing. We actually don't even know if the messages, message arrived to the other end, for example. We can have confirmations and so on. But it's really, we really need to wrap our head about the asynchronicity of all this stuff. So the main concepts are that messages are sent by producers, are delivered to consumers, and they are sent, sent over a channel. From here, depending on which messaging solution you use, is which concept will be. Like the channel in RabbitMQ specifically, they will have queues and exchanges, and so on. And so on. So 
I don't know what is the exact case in JMS, but in JMS, I think there is no such exchange concept. And uh, yeah, it really depends what is your messaging backend, but the concept of publish, subscribe still holds. So messaging and RabbitMQ. First question is, what is RabbitMQ? I don't know if all of you know or don't. But this is mostly what is, how is RabbitMQ branded on their website. It's an enterprise messaging system. It's enterprise because it's used, for example, for all these training companies in England. They are, they are using that. The, the first implementation, if I'm not mistaken, was asked by the guy from JP Morgan. So yeah, it's really from that uh, part of the industry that RabbitMQ comes from. It's open source. It's written in Erlang, OTP. This is something really important, not because it's written in Erlang, but because of all the distribution concept behind Erlang, all the, the network transparency that you get when you code in Erlang. Uh, I'm happy that the guys from RabbitMQ don't have to re-implement all that. Erlang has been tested in the industry for more than 10 years, so it's very nice if, if I mean, if, for example, if I'm doing PHP, I don't have to write again the new Apache. I can go and use Apache. The same here. This, uh, this guy can just use all the distribution protocol that airlines come uh, with. Then it has commercial support. This is somebody goes big with RabbitMQ, you can, can ask for that. And then the messaging is done via ANQP, which is a protocol. And RabbitMQ supports more protocols, but I'm not going to talk about that today. It's really reliable. I mean, like, in this dating site, we just didn't care about RabbitMQ. We just have it there, set it up, and nothing else. It's really, really simple to, to manage. It's easy to install. If you have Erlang on your machine, in less than 20 seconds, you can have, have RabbitMQ up and running. It's easy to cluster. It runs on all those platforms, which is interesting, because if you have a team which each developer running in different uh, architectures, you can make them all test and prototype there. So it depends on how your company works, but that can help. And also, it can help depending on which architecture you use to deploy your code, of course. And it supports two versions of uh, NQP, 0 0.8 and 0 0.9.1. There are many client libraries for RabbitMQ, which is, for example, Java and .NET and Erlang. Why I mention these two first is because it's, they are the only officially supported ones. The other, the Erlang one is made by some of the Rabbit guys, but it's not officially supported. And all the others are made by the community. I think now the Rabbit guys are working more strongly on the Ruby client. And the Python one is pretty advanced, I think. So what is an NQP? NQP stands for Advanced Messaging Queuing Protocol. It's made for interoperability, so you can have all these languages talking together. So that was one of the main ideas of, of NQP. And also to solve the problem of, I have my messaging architecture behind TIBCO or JMS or Microsoft, Microsoft MQ, whatever. Uh, but then I have a vendor locking, and I don't want to have that, so I can use NQP. And then if I can speak this protocol, I'm free, so to speak but tied to the protocol, of course. The <laughs> it's just a minor point. <laughs> it's a completely open protocol. There is a whole committee doing it, and it's a binary protocol. So how does the message flow go here? We have a producer, as I said before, which sends a message to the broker. The message will go to an exchange. The exchange will check the binding uh, rules, and will see if the routing key that the message has originally matches some of these bindings from exchange to queue. If those happen, then the, the message will go to the queue. And then uh, the consumer is a, is a process. This is what we actually need to write the code. We need to write the code for the producer and from the, for the consumer. will be fetching messages from one queue, from many queues. It depends on the architecture. So. That is what is called the, the MQP model, which is exchanges, message queues, bindings, and the rules for binding the queues to the exchange. There are three kinds of exchange type, which are fan out, direct, and topic. And all the patterns are built around this concept here. So the publish subscribe one can be implemented with the fan out exchange. So we send a message to a fan out exchange, and then on the other end, we bind as many queues as we want to this uh, exchange. 
So one message that enters the broker and goes to this exchange will then be fan outed to all those uh, queues. Then on each queue, we can have one consumer or 20 consumers. Th that's how we scale, kind of. So RabbitMQ will take care of doing the round robin of the messages through all the connected consumers to one queue. Uh, we'll take care of if one consumer fails, get the message back and send it to another consumer and so on. So we don't need to take care of that. That's something that messaging will give to our, our application. We just need to build very small pieces of code like uh, this consumer that do the, the resize of the image. All it needs to work is the image metadata and the user ID, something like that. That's all it needs to, to be working on. So it just works on one parameter that it gets to it, which is the message. Then we have the direct exchange. This is very simple. We send a message to, to this exchange, and it, the message will only go to the queue that matches this routing key. And then one of the uh, advanced exchanges, or which you can implement really cool patterns with it, for example, for login, if you need to do distributed login over a cluster or something, this is really helpful. So how does it work? You send messages to the exchange with routing keys, like usa.news, usa.weather, europe.news, europe.weather. And then you will have queues which will be bound to the exchange. For example, this one is bound to usa.sharp. So whatever message that starts with usa will go to that queue. The same for news. It doesn't matter if the news comes from Europe or for US, from USA and so on. Let's say tomorrow we are interested on, on news from Asia. We just publish news there with this asia.news uh, or asia.weather and so on. So we have completely decoupled architecture from the publishers, from what they send to who is interested on the other end. So if for some reason we don't care anymore about news from the states, sorry, there is some version from the states, uh, we just kill this consumer. We just delete the queue and then there is nothing else. And then tomorrow, well, it happened to be an important country in the world, so we need to be listening from news from the state. We just fire a new, a new consumer and with a queue and that's it. We, as a producer, Really, 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 we don't care what's on the other end. We just fire and forget. So how you can do distributed logging with that? For example, instead of using USA.news, you can say my server host dot application dot log level. And then you, you can have a listener for errors. You can have a listener for servers on which start on the my server host name range or by IP, or I don't know. So you can do a lot of routing and filtering of logs depending on what you are interested. Suddenly you got a call on, on the, an emergency call that server 20 is sending a lot of errors. You just fire a new queue, get all the errors from that server, see what's going on. OK, problem solved. You kill the queue, no more messages. And, and that's, I think, it's pretty easy and scalable, let's say. So now to go to the messaging patterns after all this background. There are many of them, as I say. There is this book written by one of the Google guys. And yeah, you can visit the site. All the patterns, descriptions, solutions, and graphics are all open source. So, or Creative Commons, I don't know if there is a difference there, but you can get them. So there are basic patterns, and there are what I call the advanced ones. So I, I don't know if I have time for all of them. So one which is really important is if we want to scale is called the competing consumers. So if the question is how can we process many messages in, uh, con concurrently? And the solution is to create many competing consumers listening on a queue in the case of RabbitMQ. And then the server will do all this round robin of messages. So the uh, architecture is something like that. We have a sender, which is sending many messages to, to a queue. Actually, messages are not sent to queues. They are sent to exchange, binding queue, but just to simplify a bit. 
So on this queue, we have three, con three consumers, or two in this case, and then the server will do all this round robin of messages according to the speed of each uh, consumer. So as I said, if we need to scale up, we add more consumers, and they will compete for messages. If we need to scale down, we can remove them. And of course, uh, if there is no consumer, uh, the server will take care of queuing the messages. That's what, why there is a queue. So keep in mind that a consumer process is not tied to a queue. It could be tied to a queue. We can say, yeah, if this consumer dies, delete the queue and all its contents, or we can have the queue persisting on the server. So for a longer queue, where we are only interested for messages on a short period of time, we may have a transient queue that will go away after the consumer is, is queued, but sometimes we want to queue even if there is no consumer or if they are all busy processing messages. So this is now is the verbose part. Uh, on NQP works with many me method calls and classes. So on the exchange, we can declare an exchange, we can delete an exchange, and so on. We can declare a queue, we can bind a queue, we can purge a queue, we can delete the queue, and yeah. There are many things we can do on each of the classes on INQP, like exchanges, queues. So what we will always do in, in INQP is to create or declare an exchange, declare a queue, and bind them. So in this case, we have an exchange, which will be the name of the exchange will be whatever this function takes as parameter. The type will be direct, and, the, and it will be durable. We can say it's not durable, for example. Then we declare a queue with whatever name we pass as to this function, and we say this queue, we don't need to make it durable. So once the the server dies or, or the consumer goes away, we can remove it, for example. And then we bind, bind them together and we don't use any routing key because it's a fan out exchange, so it doesn't matter. Whatever message arrives will go to all the queues that are bound to it or in a direct exchange also. And then when we publish a message, for example, in an NQP, you have many properties on the message headers. It's like an envelope when you send a message. So the postman reads the envelope and says, oh, this is for Kurfans Trust 9, blah, 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 blah. And then the message will go there. What's the content? What's inside? The postman shouldn't care. <laughs> and, and yeah, RabbitMQ or, or NQP brokers, they tend to not uh, change the content of messages. <laughs> Should not happen. So uh, yeah, we can have many properties. In this case, it's delivery mode two, which if you have a library, you will probably have a constant which, is, uh, which says what is persistent, like instead of have a hard-coded two there. So what we are telling Rabbit is to persist a message, and the content type, which application shows on, but you, you can put, I don't know, whatever is the content type of the message. And then when we publish, we always publish to an exchange, an MQP message, which is made of the header and the payload. And that's all. So on the other end, we have consumers. And wait, just a minor detail. Why, why is called declare for both queues and exchanges and not create? Because declare means, in the NQP parlance, means create if not present. So we don't need to be doing an if a case in the, in the code like, if is this queue not present, created, else use the queue. In a NQP, you just declare the queue. If it's there, it will be there. The, for example, for the queue, the server will reply how many messages there are on the queue, if it's already present, of course, how many consumers there are, and the queue name, which that's, the, this queue name could be used also in, in other patterns. So the consumer, the consumer can call the init call from before, and then just send a message to the server, which is basic consume, the queue name and the ticket. This doesn't matter. So you just tell to which queue you want to get messages. And then something interesting from here 
is because declare means create if not present, we can run 20 publishers, one nothing will crash, and we can run 20 consumers, one nothing will crash on the server. We just make sure we have everything in place for this particular process that is running here. Then, when we get a message from the server, when there is a basic deliver command, which the server will send a delivery tag, we can use this tag later for acknowledging the message. So after we do something with the message, for example, process picture, send Twitter, whatever, we acknowledge the server that we process the message. So the server will remove the message from the queue. Then, for example, on basic consume, we can say no acknowledge. So this will speed up a lot the, the message, uh, the speed of the messaging, because we don't need to acknowledge the message back. So as soon as the message is sent to our consumer, if we were not acknowledging, then the server just delete the message and continue sending more stuff. So next, the public subscribe that we already saw, how to broadcast uh, uh, messages to all interested receivers. We, we got this architecture, and again, competing consumers from before is not exclu exclusive with this one. We can have competing consumers on the other end, because those subscribers, actually in RabbitMQ or in NQP, they will be queues. So to those queues, we can have as many competing consumers as we want. So the only difference in this code is that the, the, the exchange type is fan out. Besides that, everything is the same. And then, yeah, we just publish the message. Again, the same thing. And then we can have a consumer, which will be the resize image queue we'll be using instead of a generic queue. We we'll consume from, from that queue. And in, in the code, the only difference is here. We just resize the picture. So we, we start to get really uh, clean code. We don't ha need to have, like, I don't know, some, everything intermixed. Then for notif friend, friends notification, again, we, we, this time we just uh, bind the notify friends queue. And we, when we get a message, we notify the friends. And finally, uh, to log the image upload, a new requirement, somebody wants to log so every time there is a new picture upload, yeah, we just write this code and that's it. Then another pattern that I see people asking a lot of time on the RabbitMQ mailing list is how to implement request reply. If, if everything is asynchronous, I mean, how do I actually get a reply here? It seems like I, I never get a reply in, in NQP. Well, actually not. We can't get replies. So the first a step is to have a server, which will be just an exchange. So let's say we have a, a system that counts words in a text. So we can have this word count exchange. We send messages to the word count exchange or server. And the server will reply back to the word count client. But this is really, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to work like that because everything is hard code. We have the server name hard coded. We have the, the server has the client hard coded. So it's quite hard to, to scale, to adapt, and so on. So that's why there is something called return address. This is another pattern where in each message we include a, a reply to property. So whenever we have a, a request, we, we send that in, in the message. So in this case, we have the requester one and the requester uh, two, and each of them will have uh, a reply to channel, reply channel one, reply channel two, and the server will inspect the message headers, the envelope, and from there it will say, okay, this message needs to go back here or there. But now, we got the, the coupling part on the, on the server, but now how do we know as, as as requester that this uh, reply comes from this server and not from this other server. For example, we can have, uh, let's say, a PHP application that, that uh, has two database queries. One takes five seconds, another one takes two seconds. If we run all sequentially, we need, we need seven seconds. But we can run both in parallel. But then when they come back, how, how do we match what to what? That can be done using a correlation identifier 
which is also there on, on NQP. So every time we send a message, we will have the reply to property plus the correlation identifier. So when the, when the server replies back, it will see, okay, this message needs to go to this reply queue, and I will set the correlation ID to whatever the client put before, so it, we complete the cycle. So if we put it all together, what we have to do is we need a, a consumer. We, for example, for the client, we don't need to acknowledge any message. As long as the server replies, that's all we want. And we say the queue is exclusive, so it only belongs to me. Nobody will get replies from this queue, no, no other consumer. And yeah, it will be auto-deleted. Once this process dies, the, the queue will go away. And then we store the queue name somewhere on the process state. And then to send a request, we just say in the message properties, besides whatever else we set, the correlation ID and the reply to. We send that to the server exchange. And then whenever we got some message back, we get the correlation ID out of the message, and we do something with the reply, and we know from what it belongs to. So the RPC server. We get the message, besides declaring the exchange, all the other stuff that we already saw. It gets the correlation ID, it gets the replies to, it processes the request and gets the reply, the amount of words, whatever. And then it creates a new property, which will be, will have the correlation ID that it got from the client. It doesn't need to know what that correlation ID is. It just needs to know to pull it back on the message. And then it will publish to an anonymous exchange, so there is no name on the exchange, the message with these properties, and the routing key, which we haven't used so far, the routing key will be the queue name. So on MQP, every queue is bound to the anonymous exchange by the queue name. So if I want to send a message to a queue without creating an exchange, I can send the message to the anonymous exchange using the queue name as routing key. So the same thing we can use for RPC. I don't know if you have questions so far, because then I have the advanced patterns, but we have like eight minutes for the talk. So any questions? Yes? You hear a lot about RabbitMQ or other RackMQ or zero. But yeah. Can you compare with other frameworks other than just presenting this one? Say zero MQ, uh, which is brokerless and supposedly yeah, this, quite this fast. Yeah, this should work perfectly with zero MQ. So these would just be the same patterns. Either. The patterns are the same. The only difference is maybe how you implement them based on the protocol behind. But yeah, they will work. So the next question that we have, once we have all this architecture, is what these guys say, say on the book is, OK, all these patterns are really nice. It's like the architecture dream, but the developer nightmare. Because then how you debug that? How do you debug all these messages going out here and there? And you don't know what's going on, what's where, and so on. So there are many patterns in the advanced ones. I, will, I want to show you one, which is the control bus. So, this, is, this pattern is all about administering a, a messaging bus. So what we do, what we can do in a control bus, you will have the slides online, no, don't worry, is we can send configuration messages to the consumers on the producers. For example, you can tell them, the broker here is down or it's too slow, we start, start sending messages to this other broker. We can start or stop services. We can inject text messages like, what is the health of this uh, RPC server? Is it fast enough? Is it sending the proper replies and so on? So we can have a test message that we know that it contains 20 words, and the reply should be in less than five seconds, because more than five seconds is too slow for my application, and it should reply 20, 20 words. So, and we can also use it to collect uh, statistics. So basically, we, we will have all the message flow on the system, and then we have the control bus there, sending messages up and down. So an architecture I'm kind of trying to implement now in Erlang is to have 
control aware consumers and control aware producers. So every time I, I start as a consumer or a producer, I also make it listen to the control queue or, the, or bind to the control exchange. So what happens there is I, I have all the message flow and also I can get messages from the control bus. Like I have a word count server and suddenly I tell the server, no, start uh, resizing images now. We don't need your resources as a word count server anymore. So we can do all that without stopping the, the system. All the other patterns, the, they are related to this one, the one I wanted to present, but there is not enough time. So if you have questions. No? Yeah? Uh, is there an overview? Uh, when you create a lot of queues, is there an, uh, a lot of overhead associated with an individual queue? Or can you say you have like a million queues and you're only really using 10 of them right now? You can have as many as the Erlang virtual machine would allow to have processes. Each queue is a process in RabbitMQ. So that is your, your limitation, and then there is a minimum amount of bytes uh, per, per queue. But of course, physical memory and, and that number in Erlang, which you can tune up also. It's in the, I think it's in the order of billions. So. Um, at the beginning, when you started changing the, the code for, <laughs> for a message brokerage, yeah. you changed the problem from a source maintenance problem into a modeling problem, because you had to model the, the messages you, you want to send. You want to what? To model the yeah. messages you want to send for all these different, uh, different types of application or, or mm -hmm. end users you have. What are the best... Uh, best practices for this because you can get into a into a very ugly position when you're gonna get when you do have these huge messages which should be generic for every kind of thing you want to do at the end yeah for me it, 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 as always it really depends on what your use case so if uh, for some application that I mean I will never use any message for some applications I, I think like zero MQ is much faster or lighter than have a broker but then on your MQ hand, you don't have like uh, queuing, proper queuing like storage. So in this case, it's the same. Like it depends uh, up to where you want to have this decoupling and, and where you have want to have everything locally. So at, and the long run, I think messaging is is the way to go. But I don't know in a small application if I will go that way. But. If you need to later scale to requirements, if you were doing messaging before, you are ready to scale to requirements. I'm not saying to number of users. But uh, it's, for me, I, I don't really like to go in this white and black kind of questions, because it really depends. Anyone else? OK, <laughs> thank you very much.